Welcome to the Probate Nation. I am Richard Ruddy. Our show this evening is the second of a two-part series on selling real estate held in a Georgia estate or conservatorship. Tonight, the show will cover the value of staging a property, where and how to list a property for sale, marketing strategy, strategies, the sales contract, and closing the sale. We are pleased to have two experienced realtors to cover these topics and more so that you, the executor or conservator, can position the property to sell quickly and for the best price. Let me tell you a little bit about these real estate professionals. Our first guest is a Georgia, Georgia native. He graduated from Kennesaw State University in Georgia with a civil engineering degree. And since graduation, he has been the director of land development for several large national builders. In recent years, he has worked as a licensed real estate broker. Uh, and today, he is a top producing broker with Atlanta Communities Real Estate Brokerage, where he sells residential real estate from Metro Atlanta to the Georgia mountains. Our second guest graduated from the University of Houston, also with a civil engineering degree, so you'll see a pattern here. Over the ensuing years after graduation, he has worked in the real estate industry as an owner, developer, builder, and licensed realtor of residential homes in the greater Atlanta community. It is noteworthy that at each step in his career, he has won awards for his work. He is presently the managing broker and vice president at Atlanta Communities Real Estate Brokerage. Please welcome back Georgia Realtors Carl Hawthorne and Robert Williamson. Guys, thanks very much for coming back. You know, Carl, I, I, I want to jump right in because we have a lot to cover tonight. Let's talk a little about what does it mean to say that a property need, is going to be staged? What does that mean? So the word staged is basically making an environment like home. So buying a house is an emotional appeal to people, no matter if it's an engineer buddy of mine or just a typical family going into a house, they want it to feel like home. And the staging allows that relationship, that marriage to occur where you feel this could be my home. And so by staging it, appropriately, we find that 95% of homes sell quicker, faster, and for higher money by being staged. Very interesting. So the, the purpose behind the staging is, as you say, to kind of make people visualize the house could be theirs, and this is where they could live. Exactly. So, so who, who would make the arrangements for staging, um, Carl? How does, that do, how does that go down? So staging has changed in uh, the last couple of years. We can go in and fully furnish rooms in a house. That is very costly. Typically, your agent will either have a stager on their staff or someone that they hire to come into a home and meet with the seller and see what furniture would look good to make those pictures and that First impression is so key. How to make that first impression last with that consumer. That is typically a monthly fee and usually paid by the seller for that rental of that furniture. That so, can get very expensive. So there is a cost sorry, for ahead. the staging. So I guess the first thing I think from what I understand from our preparation for the show is to, is to figure out you know, with a professional, you know, what should be done to make this house look really, really good. So is there any furniture we could use? If there's not, does there some clutter we need to be cleared out and so on? So, um, uh, and there is a cost apparently for that person to come and give those advice and then a cost to them to actually stage the property. So uh, you mentioned that we could actually, if, if they don't have good furniture, we can actually rent the furniture then. That's the next thing I think you were getting at. Yes, so there's several different ways of staging. One would be staging what they currently have, as you just mentioned. And so I have a stager on staff that will go to the home, spend an hour with the client, and then we'll let them know what furniture needs to go and be packed away in the storage unit or maybe in the basement or garage. 
and what other items need for is decluttering and taking away some of the personal items. Again, making sure that first impression is so important. We also want to make sure those pictures are just perfect because engaging pictures will actually go viral on Zillow, just like they do on Facebook or Instagram. Oh, so we want to make sure that first impression is key for that. Very interesting. Now, you mentioned something, Carl, in our, in our preparation for this show that I found very interesting. I had not heard before, uh, and, I've, and I deal with a lot of different realtors here in Northern Virginia, um, this concept called virtual staging. Tell me a little bit about that and how that might come into play. So in situations where the house is vacant or maybe the owner's furniture is just not great furniture for the price point, maybe they uh, looks like a college room dorm where it's not very nice furniture, but you're selling a million dollar home that's going to devalue the look and feel of that home. So if we can get all their furniture out, we can go in and actual have one of our photographers that will basically Photoshop virtualized pictures, 3D pictures of beds, furniture, TVs, wall paintings, rugs, wow. anything we need to make that home appear like real furniture is in that home. Wow, I thought that was just totally amazing. That's, uh, that's very cool. Especially, you know, I guess a lot of people will never actually walk into the house they'll actually be viewing the house remotely anyway because they may be across the country. Um, well, uh, in this particular section, uh, Carl, tell me some of the lessons you've learned and that you advocate to your, your clients about the staging process and the importance of staging. One of the great things is setting up the expectation of letting your clients know that Yes, the way you present your home and the way you live in your home is perfect for you, but we've got to appeal to a larger audience. And with that, we need to neutralize paint colors. We need to make the home look so close to what they see on HGTV because we know the closer it is to that, the quicker it's going to sell and it's going to sell for a higher price. Do you find, uh, Carl, that for every dollar that you put into staging, that you get a nice return on your on your price for a house for the house? Currently, we're seeing, for let's say you're putting carpet in, typically you can get double the value back on carpet paint. In some cases, especially for like kitchen cabinets, people want not the stained kitchen cabinets. They're looking for the painted based on different color schemes. And in some cases there, you can get three times the value back by just painting those cabinets. Okay, those are lots important. So Robert, let me turn to you. And just before we go on to the next topic, tell me a little bit about your thoughts and experiences but about staging a property for sale. Well, it's, it's very important, as Carl was saying, and, and these days it's affordable to do using the digital staging. Since we're kind of uh, related to estates uh, on today's show, many times an estate might um, have dated furniture or things that uh, are, are going to be not that attractive to a new buyer. So we might be working with an estate sale just to clear the house out and uh, we might be dealing with a vacant property. Besides just thinking about staging as a furniture uh, uh, exercise, uh, cleanliness is the best. If an immacul immaculately clean house will show so much better and be more attractive to anyone that visits it. And then updated paint and carpet are the basics. Digital staging after that is gonna make it show well online. And then when uh, that prospective buyer comes, if it's nice, clean, fresh carpet, fresh paint, it's going to go a long way in making it uh, marketable. So we, we, we've got we've done we've come a long way from 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 the beginning of this uh, process. So Robert, how do how is the listing price for the property that now has been put in shape and we we're getting it staged appropriately? How is the listing price established? Well. There's going to be um, a market study done by a professional realtor, and I think 
through consultation with the realtor who should educate you about market conditions, what your competition is on the market, what the market time is you can expect, and to tell you uh, how the condition of the property is going to affect that market price up or down, then that's how a seller is going to determine the listing price that's appropriate. Okay. Now, well, I know that we still put for sale signs in the front of the house. So when does the for sale sign typically get put in the front yard these days? Well, I'd say typically now uh, it gets put in the front yard, I would say two to five days before the house actually goes on the market. Sometimes a little bit sooner to that in a coming soon status to try to build a little market excitement before the public or the realtors are actually allowed in to see the house. Uh, but I would also emphasize it doesn't need to go in the yard um, or, or be put out there until the executor and whoever is in control of the estate knows that they have the proper authority to sell the, sell the house. And uh, so as we talked a, a little bit in the pre-preparing um, for the show, so that I know that, that, that um, you guys are very strong, that there's no sort of pre-sale or private sale opportunities. Everything is out in the open from the get-go. Anybody can see the property and can buy the property. Is that, uh, I, I know you wanted to emphasize that. Well, I, I would like to address that a little bit and uh, to make sure that uh, you're adhering to all fair housing standards and, and to maximize the property's value it's important to put the property on the market so that all individuals and their realtors have a chance to see the home and make an offer. Okay. Uh, many times an owner might think they want to limit the number of people that are seeing the house out of convenience or just um, some other notion that they might have, but to maximize value, it needs to be shown to the entire marketplace. Okay. Now, when is the actual listing of the property formally made active? Is there a particular point when that happens? Yes, it, it would be um, an agreed upon date by the owner of the property and the realtor. And uh, that's when it would actually go live and hit the MLS systems, hit all the social media marketing, marketing that your realtor is using and also be syndicated out to uh, websites really across the world, your typical uh, Zillow's, uh, Realtor.com, and uh, the list goes on and on. Our listings get syndicated to more than 200 websites um, around the world. Awesome, awesome. Before I, before I, I, I move out of this particular topic area, uh, any final thoughts or words of advice or lessons learned, Robert, you want to share about listing the property for sale? Well, Make sure the house is ready to go on the market. Make sure legally you have the authority to sell it. Make sure you've interviewed realtors uh, that are experienced in handling uh, the type of property that you're selling and they're market experts in your area. And um, from there, you should have a, a good experience. That's, a, that's good, good advice. Now, Carl, I'm gonna to turn to you before I jump into the next topic. Any comments you wanna share or lessons you've learned? about listing the property for sales. We've gotten to this stage of making the improvements. We've done all the things we need to make the house look good and we've got it staged properly. Any final sort of lessons learned as we get to this point? Sellers like to rush the get this on the market now after they have spent weeks of uh, trying to get this property ready and then they want to rush their agent to get pictures as soon as possible and get it listed and the problem is if you rush things it looks rushed online and like as robert said this gets syndicated out to a lot 200 plus third-party sites once those original pictures go out they're out there and there's nothing you can do to take them back um, it just is not possible so if you put bad pictures out there and then come back and put the finalized pictures after all the boxes are taken out or that roof repair is done or the new carpet all the consumers will not see that they will see the old pictures so don't rush the last part it's like not finishing the 10 percent of the rest of the home and trying to sell it you're just going to lose that momentum and all that work that you did to get to that point well, I think that leads very nicely into the next topic, Gary, which talks about marketing the property. So I, I gather from you and Robert that 
You guys are up on all kinds of things. I guess you guys are in Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. All those things have some sort of activity when you put a house up for sale. Um, how, is the, how is the property, other than generating that enthusiasm, how is the property actually shown to prospects who might be interested in making an offer? So Zillow is really a Facebook for houses. It's just a, another name just like Redfin and some of the others. And so we as realtors need to understand that if, if it's not an engaging picture on Facebook, it's not going to be an engaging picture on Zillow or Realtor or those other sites. And what does Facebook do when the picture is not engaging? Well, they want viewers on their site, so they'll suppress the audience reach that that picture is being shown to. Zillow does the same thing in the other websites. If the house is not engaging, people are not clicking through the pictures, they're going to push that listing down because they want more consumers on their site. And so many agents do not realize that. You know, Carl, I know we, you and I chatted about this, about the whole picture thing, I and mean, I think you're emphasizing that, but is there the possibility of having too many pictures? Oh, absolutely. I just did a TikTok on that this week <laughs> about people that put in over a hundred pictures for a medium sized home. Unless you've got a sprawling ranch with multiple buildings and houses, you don't need to put more than 25 to maybe 40 pictures. Because one thing is if it takes you 10 clicks to get to the front door, and you didn't like one of the yard shots that maybe was just a bad angle, you're going to jump to another house. You need to have your money shots in the first four pictures or consumers in a world where they just swipe, swipe, swipe. They need to see the great content right away or they're just going to miss that home. And data shows that people will go four pictures deep before they decide to go any further. And if they don't go any further, they never come back to that house, even if that house lowers by 20,000 or more. Well, tell me about the, you, you mentioned this, and I, I thought this was very interesting when we were, I was writing up the, uh, the, the, the program outline. W what are the money shots that we want to capture in those first four or five shots? So of course, you've got to have the front shot that's just required by the MLSs. But the next shot is, does it have a swimming pool? Well, if it has a swimming pool currently after COVID, having a swimming pool is a huge deal for people. People are paying more for swimming pools than they even pay for houses now. <laughs> so you need to have that shot there. Everyone loves the kitchen shot. Whether or not they ever use their kitchen or not, they want the <laughs> latest kitchen and so they're going to want to see what that kitchen looks like. And master baths are huge. Your owner suite bathroom is a big deal for people. That's where they, they want to see the frameless showers. They want to see the soaking tub, all of those things. And if you've got those features, but you put them back to picture 20 or 40, then they're never going to get there. Okay, well, that's, well that is, I think is a very important because those are things, people do make the mistake of trying to load up a gazillion pictures when, and that just doesn't do them any good. Robert, I'm gonna come back to you now. We're trying to close the property, okay. Um, what are some of the typical concessions that sellers are, are asking for these days? That uh, sellers might be giving in to a buyer that's asking for it. Well, I'll tell you here in Georgia, we've got a very strong seller's market, despite some of the other uh, uh, financial woes you read about in the paper and, and rising interest rate. We still have limited inventory here, and uh, the sellers have the advantage in the negotiations. So, uh, believe it or not, we frequently see multiple offers on the same property. And in those multiple offers, we see buyers um, offering uh, above list price, and those houses are closing. So we've got a strong market here. We don't see a lot of seller concessions. Having said that, Georgia is also a uh, state where most contracts have a due diligence period in the beginning. So 
the property goes under a binding contract with a buyer and a seller agreeing to the terms, then the buyer has a period, I'm going to say typically seven to 10 days in Georgia. It's, an, it's something that's negotiated in the contract. What, during that period, they can have the property inspected. And this is the toughest part of the transaction. The buyer then comes back and asks for repairs or, or concessions for things they don't like. And uh, this is where uh, the realtor comes in, um, becomes very important in these negotiations to work out what is going to be the final sales price and is the seller going to make any repairs or not. Um, after that is worked out, um, the, the concessions may be financial, they may be repairing something if, uh, let's say, an air conditioning unit was found not to be working properly, maybe the seller agrees to pay for that. Uh, the seller could also provide a home warranty through a third party warranty company. Um, and then I guess the most frequent seller concession is um, some sellers pay closing costs for the buyer. And this is particularly helpful and important to buyers that don't have uh, money over and above the minimum down payment that they need to get into the house. Okay, those are all very, very helpful. And I think one of the things I learned in our, our discussion in preparing for the show is while we used to see a lot of of, of um, uh, warranty, uh, uh, insurance warranty to cover repairs for mechanical items, apparently that's no longer top of the list anymore because of the market that apparently you're seeing. Um, Robert, in the contract, who gets to, who gets to select the uh, settlement attorney to actually close the deal? Typically, uh, that is the choice of the buyer. And, uh, and the buyer's realtor is going to help them select a closing attorney. But um, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes the seller has a preferred closing attorney and there's a good reason to use that. Often in the uh, case of an estate, some title work has already been done to make sure the title is all in order. And in those situations, uh, many times the buyer is going to uh, be best served if he'll go ahead and use the closing attorney that the seller and the seller's agent have already uh, ha have uh, hired to do title research on the property. Now, um, you've done a lot of estate work selling real estate out of estates. Do you find that <clears throat> that the uh, the seller has to take the contract back to court to get it approved before he can go to closing? No, sir. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, in uh, Georgia and uh, many other states as well, an executor has been granted full authority over the estate already by the court system, so they don't have to return to get uh, um, authority. Okay, that's good to know. Now, uh, I, I, this is something else I thought was kind of interesting. We see a lot of closings that are not done in person, that all the documents are signed in advance and then sent into the closing attorney. Uh, are you still finding that closings are being done in person in Georgia? Well, many are being done in person. Uh, during COVID, there were some special um, allowances and um, they were made so they could be done remotely. Those things have expired now. So most of the time, there's still some requirements that either the buyer or the seller come and meet with an attorney in person. Uh, sometimes if you have an out of town seller, they can sign those documents in another state in the presence of an attorney in that state. I'm gonna give my recommendation here though. Um, these are important things that are being done and there's last minute changes sometimes. The best scenario is for the buyer and the seller to attend the closing in person. And I think you had one other recommendation which I found very interesting is, do you recommend that people do a walkthrough of the property before they go to closing, the day, no, the, yeah. the day of closing? Yes, yes, yes. That's another very important thing in my opinion. And these opinions are formed by watching uh, bad things happen at the last minute in our business. So uh, I think the seller and the buyer should visit that property the last minute so they know the condition of the property before the closing and immediately after the closing. And uh, we've seen things happen such as uh, leaks at a house or air conditioning units break or uh, just all kinds of haphazard things I could tell you about. And if someone hasn't been there right before closing, you often don't know when the incident took place and who owned the property. Because the minute uh, that possession changes, the new owner is responsible for uh, the condition of the property and damage that might be done to the property from a leak from a, a water refrigerator or 
uh, something uh, that the movers might have done accidentally. So it's important to check it out uh, right before closing and make sure everybody's in agreement on the condition of the property. That's, uh, those are good advice. I'm going to go now, fellas. We have you know less than a minute to go here, so I'm going to ask you each just to real quickly, any closing comments or final words of advice you want to share. And so, uh, Carl, I'm going to come back to you. Anything you want to share with our viewers before we, we, we sign off? Marketing the property is just so important. Do not rush that last part. Like I said before, once those pictures go out on the web, you cannot bring them back. So if, always put your best foot forward. That will equal additional equity for you and the estate if you're just willing to take the time. And also, you need to check out and get reviews and ask for referrals um, of agents to make sure that agent has experience in truly marketing. You don't want someone just list your home. You want someone that's going to market your home to get the highest dollar value. And Robert, how about any final words from yourself? We're already out of time, but I just want to make sure I didn't, didn't miss out on any final words of advice you might have. Sure, I'll just throw one other thing out there along the lines of Carl and the importance of pictures. Have, make sure your realtor uses a professional photographer. You don't need some uh, one going in there and making amateur photographs of your house uh, on such an important marketing um, dur during the listing time period. Uh, Robert uh, Will Williamson, Carl Hawthorne from Atlanta Community Real Estate Brokerage. Guys, listen, I want to thank you guys so much for coming back and helping us uh, walk through the rest of the process to get this house sold. And uh, great public service to all the folks in the metro Atlanta area. And I want to thank you on behalf of the Probate Nation for taking the time to spend with us and, and share your expertise. Well, thank you for having us. You bet. Yep. Thanks, you know, Richard. You bet, Robert. Uh, you know, selling real estate, folks, presents a host of challenges if you want to maximize the sales price. You know, over the, the course of two shows, our guests experienced, they're both experienced real estate professionals. They shared their recommendations and experiences. But, of course, you can certainly attempt to prepare and sell the, hop the property yourself in an effort to save the cost of the realtor commission. But I got to tell you, I suggest you resist that temptation. Hire a professional who works in the marketplace every day. Listen to their advice, follow their advice, and at the end of the day, you will have met your fiduciary duties as executor or conservator and sold your property quickly for a market price. This concludes our show this evening. We hope you found it informative. Replays of the show can be viewed on the Probate Nation website and YouTube channel. And if you want to receive our, the uh, monthly estate administration and probate tip newsletter, you're welcome to sign up for the free Probate Nation newsletter. Thank you for visiting with us. Until next time, I am Richard Ruddy, and this is the Probate Nation.